polish it by hand, leave it, sandpaper it, polish it by hand again, go back and back and back to it. This teaches you great patience. There's a reason that you're called father. It's because you're meant to be like the father in the home. And you have to love your people as a father loves them. If God has planted something in you, and if it is compelling you this much, I guarantee you it won't go away until you do something about it. My name is Father Thomas Small. I'm a priest of the Diocese of Kilmore. Faith was a very important part of my life when I was growing up. I'm an only child. Now, when I was born, my parents were that little bit older. They were a little bit older when they got married. So when I was born, my mum was 46 and my dad was 54, I think, at the stage, at that stage. So they were a little bit older and I suppose they were of that kind of older generation than the parents of, of my friends growing up. I think I was exposed to slightly different things, maybe an older version of the faith, if you like. They would have been coming from um, a very traditional perspective. And the rosary was a very important part of uh, my life growing up. Daily rosary was said every evening, and there was lots of trimmings to it as well. I can remember that. There was the Litany of the Blessed Virgin Mary and so on. But this, I think, helped to, to ground me in a very deep faith with a, a great appreciation for, I think, for Our Lady in particular and for Our Lady's uh, role in, in our salvation and in, in leading us to Jesus. Every evening, no matter what else was going on, the TV was turned off. And at that time, we actually got down on our knees and, and said the rosary. So it was, as I say, it was a very traditional practice, a little bit old fashioned. That gave me a great grounding as a child it's, it's one of my earliest memories, daily prayer. The prayer of the morning offering was another one that my mother taught me. And I think the, the genius of the morning offering was no matter uh, how bad a day you might be having, you hand that all over to God. And that's, that's a great uh, way of living your day. First, maybe stirrings of a vocation. I can remember uh, being an altar server been recruited by the, the priest and uh, my dad would have been kind of in charge of the altar service at that time. And I can remember the night before I served Mass the first time being very nervous and wondering, is this the right thing for me to be doing? But uh, once I started, kind of really took to it and I was very happy to be doing it. And I think even at that age, possibly what, I'd been about seven or eight years of age, um, I could kind of feel a draw towards this that, um, yeah, maybe I could be a priest. I think as I went on through secondary school, well, after what we call intercert, was junior cert, we call it now, again, these stirrings about serving God as a priest, would I be able to do that? Am I good enough for that? That was really beginning to come to me around about fourth year in school, I think it was about 16 years of age. Again, like I say, we were very blessed to have very good priests in our parish. I would have talked to some of them and they would have encouraged me. One way or another, anyway, I went on, did my leaving cert. And after my leaving cert, actually, what I, what I went and did, I wasn't sure about the priesthood at all at that stage, if I'm honest. I went on then to work with my uncles. I had three uncles who were I call them woodwork craftsmen. They had a, a workshop in a place called Milltown. They were my mother's brothers. There were three single men. And they made what we'd call, we'd call it, the technical term would be reproduction furniture. Now it's reproduction of old furniture, what you call antique furniture from 1800s into the, the 1900s. So I went to them when I was finished school uh, finished the leaving cert. The trade mostly for me was, it consisted of the kind of the restoration end of it. 
So I wasn't making that much furniture as such. I was working on the, the old furniture that would be left in for repair. And as part of that, I learned a craft called French polishing. And French polishing, is it's a very slow process. You have to be very patient with it. Polish it by hand, leave it, sandpaper it, polish it by hand again, go back and back and back to it. This teaches you great patience. But as I say, my folks, they were that little bit older and they all had developed, you know, conditions in terms of their health as time went on. So eventually I ended up, well, my dad, just first of all, my dad passed away, it was rather suddenly in 1996. He'd have been about 77 years of age. He'd had trouble with, uh, with his heart all along, but um, died suddenly enough. So my mother was left there on her own. Um, then she had enough of her own health problems too. But I continued on anyway, working with the uncles. And um, as time went on, their health began to deteriorate. So I suppose I eventually found myself kind of in the position of not just doing my polishing work and so on, but being a carer to them. And sadly, in the year 2004, um, the first of my uncles passed away again rather suddenly. Now, he had suffered from rheumatoid arthritis and had suffered very heroically with it for about 13 years. But again, passed away rather suddenly that year. That was July 2004. And then in November 2004, my mother died. Just two uncles left at that stage. Um, and they were in quite poor health. So for the next, yeah, the next just under four years, I spent most of my time actually looking after them. They both developed, we call it COPD. Charlie had emphysema, Michael uh, had chronic bronchitis. A lot of it could have been from the work in the earlier days. Anyway, I spent the next number of years looking, looking after them. Michael passed away in 2007, and then Charlie passed away in 2008. So then I was left pretty much on my own. I worked along in the business anyway for another little while, I suppose for all in all, again, for another five years after Charlie passed on, but I knew fine well that this desire was still very deep in me. And I didn't really know, was it for priesthood? Was it for some other form of service in the church? But I knew I had to do something about it because it wasn't giving me peace of mind, if you know what I mean. About 2009, our diocese set up a permanent diaconate program. So we have, well, we've two serving permanent deacons in the diocese uh, at the moment. Sadly, one of the, the guys passed away a number of years ago, not long after he was ordained. We have two serving men in the diocese. Please God, we'll have more. But uh, I was again persuaded by a very kind parish priest at the time to, he says, sure, give it a go anyway. And I did. So I signed up for that. Again, you go through all the sort of processes of vetting and and to see if you're, if you're suitable to uh, take on this responsibility. Well, thank God I was accepted onto the permanent diaconate uh, program. And I, I went along there for about three years. It was like every second weekend and so on, and retreats and days of recollection and so on. I have to say it was very spiritually uplifting. There were three of us um, that, that went forward to the full program. I say after about two or three years, I was saying to myself, yeah, look, I really love this. This is, this is good. But I think I still, want, I still want to go further. I think, yes, diaconate is a beautiful vocation and so on, but I think I am still called to the priesthood. I think I was wrong to just give up on it, just on account of the fact of being in my mid thirties. And I talked to the I had a good conversation with the director of the diaconate program who was basically discerning the same thing. He said to me, look, Thomas, I think, I think your call really is priesthood. So I went for it. I went for it and I entered uh, Maynooth College. 
in 2013. Um, along with, the, I think there was 20 of us started that year. It was one of the, the biggest intakes in uh, the year 2013. I think so far, there are about five of us have been ordained out of that class. Um, a lot of guys to turn out, a lot of guys decide it isn't for them. And that's perfectly all right, I suppose, and it's such a big class. I think I went in kind of on a high in the sense that, wow, I can't believe I'm actually doing this after all these years of thinking about it, discerning, and so on. I say that class of 20, we, we all bonded very well together. And I think we bonded with the rest of the guys in the house that were, say, ahead of us and so on. One of the, I say, I was obviously had to lay aside for a time anyway, the polishing, all that kind of work and so on. But I found a sort of a new outlet for that side, that kind of creative side that I like to attend to in the College Chapel Choir in Maynooth. But there's a gentleman there uh, by the name of John O'Keefe. John is the director of sacred music. He's also a um, professor in the university. I got a message, a text message from John O'Keefe. Can you come and see me? This was one evening in Maynooth. And I thought, okay, great. They've probably gone and put a scratch in the organ now and they want someone like me to come and try to take it out. So I went down to John anyway in the sacred music room in his office and he says, he says, you're in the choir. I said, what? He says, you're in the choir. You're, you're in second base in the choir and we have a practice now tomorrow night. So we'll come along to that. I didn't think I was choir material at all. What John does in the, your very first week in Maynooth, he takes you in beside the piano, gives you a hymn book, you sing a hymn, and then you go away. And I thought to myself, yeah, that's grand. No, I'll not be in the choir. But I was. First year of theology, then pastoral year. Pastoral year was actually was spent, half of it was spent here in this parish in Cavan Town, where I'm sitting right now along with Father Kevin, who is the administrator, who's still the administrator here. And you learn a heck of a lot, I have to say, when you're, um, when you're in a parish, when you're meeting people, when you're dealing with real situations. I think it's, it's a good system that you study philosophy, first of all, which helps you to, to think before you approach theology. And yes, theology is, is a good thing too, to study theory and so on. But then you have to put it into practice. And that's, I guess, what what um, pastoral year was about. How would I, I suppose describe my life with God uh, at that time in the seminary? I like to think there was a, you know, a good sort of continuity with that life of prayer that went before it from my childhood into my teenage years. Um, all this like to keep things simple. Where do I find God, especially? Um, there's always, for me, I suppose that, those kind of two things, finding God in prayer, in the liturgy, the liturgy of the hours. Funny enough, I was actually praying morning and evening prayer from the liturgy of the hours since I was about 19, when I was discerning priesthood for the first time just happened to walk into a Veritas one day and, and see this book, Morning and Evening Prayer. And I took to it and I really loved it, I have to say. And, and I maintain that that practice of the Liturgy of the Hours, short form of it, was what kept the vocation alive. Finding things in your life that have stayed the same, stayed the same from childhood, teenage, young adulthood, and now as an older adult, shall we say, and embarking on a newer way of life, I can see there's that, if you like, that thread where God has been working through the familiar. Now, as it was something that struck me yesterday, the day before yesterday, I was called to the hospital. I do hospital duty one day a week. And the lay chaplain in the hospital called me and he said, four people for you to anoint this morning. Um, he'd obviously done the rounds and was just trying, you know, to, um, just so I wouldn't be called later, we'd say. 
and he says four people for you to anoint. So as you know, when a priest anoints uh, a person, the sacrament of the sick, you anoint the person on first on the forehead. You, you dip your thumb in the oil, you anoint the person on the forehead, and you say through this holy anointing with the Lord and his love and may the Lord help you. I'll think of the formula in a minute. But anyway, you you anoint the person's head and you anoint their hands. And when I was going around doing those four anointings, it struck me, this is a very familiar feeling on my thumb. Right, I hadn't done four in a row ever. Just, you know, you, you do the odd one, it'll be just one. Today, maybe a couple of days from now. But doing four in a row, so my thumb was uh, quite saturated with the, with the holy oil. And it was a very familiar feeling. I was thinking, what, what does this remind me of? And I remembered when I was French polishing. You dip your thumb in the linseed oil to lubricate the polishing pad as you're going along. So oftentimes I had a thumb that was saturated with oil from the work that I was doing. And that kind of knocked me back on my feet and it said, wow, so what I'm seeing now is the continuity between what I was doing in, in my previous life, if we put it that way, and what I'm doing now. And how the things that I, that were important to me back then, and again, say, having to act as a carer for my own folks when they were sick, back and forth to the hospital here, Cavan General Hospital, where they would have all been at that time, 15, 20 years ago. It gave me a great familiarity with the layout of the building, we'd say. Simple things like that, that I can see this continuity that that life prepared me for this and that there's no, if you like, there's no contradiction. People often say to me, are you sorry you didn't become a priest earlier? No. If God had wanted me to be a priest 20 years ago, I would have been. But he obviously had some other work for me to do, um, which was precisely that. I believe that what is meant to be is meant to be, and it's meant to be in its, in its own right time. Uh, it's an Ecclesiastes where we have the list of there's a time for everything under heaven. And that's very true. This was the time for priesthood. And yet for me now in priesthood at, well, I was 45 when I was ordained, I'm nearly 48 now. Um, this is the right time. This is the right time and it feels right. And, and I thank God every day for it. As a priest, I think you're called not just to work for your people, you're called to love them as well. There's a reason that you're called father. It's because you're meant to be like the father in, in the home. And you have to love your people as a father loves them. So I was talking about prayer and I was talking about liking to keep things simple. Now, like I said, when, when I was growing up, the family rosary was very much in, in, in my family. Should mention too, I'm an only child, so it was just the three of us, my mother, my father, myself, saying the rosary in the evenings. And um, it also talked about continuity and how the same things that you learned as a child and that you did as a child and a, and a young person keep you going into, into later life as well. The two lessons I would say that it teaches me is prayer is simple, prayer is very simple, but stick at it and be disciplined. fulfillment? <laughs> Discover true happiness. Stay tuned to Shalom World.